ever get that feeling. You <laughs> yeah. know, like the thing we learned back in school about history, maybe it got like simplified a bit too much along the way. Mm, I see what you mean. Yeah, like what if, just imagine for a second, the church and the whole rise of the state. <laughs> what if it's not that simple? What if it wasn't just one thing leading straight to the other? It's such a classic story though, isn't it? You've got the church, Middle Ages, all that influence and bam, powerful states just show up. But yeah, we're digging into that assumption today for sure. Right. That's exactly what we wanted to look at, how the church might have actually had a hand in building the kind of power structures we're, you know, often kind of skeptical of these days. Right, right. So to get into this, we're going deep on this article from, get this, Free Life. It's a libertarian publication. Ooh, okay. This is going to be good. Yeah. So we're in for some out there thinking, that's for sure. See, now that's what makes these deep dives so interesting. Challenging the usual stories with something, you know, you don't hear every day. Love it. For real. So let's back up for a sec. Back to like high school history class, right? Remember the usual story. Church gets super powerful, influences everything, and suddenly, boom, powerful states. Oh, yeah. It's all those greatest hits they throw at you. Investiture controversy, who gets to pick bishops, church versus the rulers. Then you've got Gelasius the Sand trying to draw lines in the sand. Gregory the Sucter looking to make the church's reach even bigger. And don't forget, they always bring up how even just the language, right? <laughs> the Vulgate Bible, that Latin translation, that's evidence. Roman ideas creeping in everywhere. Sneaky, sneaky. Totally. It's like they want us to see that as proof the church was like on this one-way train to making a centralized power structure, just like a modern state. Compelling narrative. Gotta give them that. Yeah. B-U-T, and this is a big one, our free life article. It goes in a totally different direction, like totally throws a wrench in it. Suggests the church wasn't leading to state power. It was trying to stop it. Whoa, okay. <sighs> now that is a plot twist I did not see coming. Right. And it's even wilder because the author, Frank Van Dunn, he used to believe that whole church equals state power thing. He did, yeah. Which honestly makes this whole thing even more interesting. The fact that he changed his mind. And now this article, it's saying the church wasn't some stepping stone to big government, but more like a roadblock. So hold on. Are we saying the Middle Ages were completely different from what we usually think? Like the church is holding back big government instead of helping it along. That's the gist, yeah. Get ready to rewrite some history because it gets pretty wild. So the article really digs into how medieval Europe actually worked. And like, it's not what you'd expect. We always think about this like straight line, you know, from kings and queens to the nation state. Like it was inevitable, but it was way messier than that. Okay, so pretend I've never heard of the Middle Ages. Paint me a picture of what's going on that we're missing in the usual story. All right, so imagine instead of one big power, like a king at the top, right? It's like this web. You've got cities. They've got their own laws. Guilds, those tradesmen groups, they're running their own show. Even the church has its fingers and things, but locally. So it's like a bunch of smaller powers all bumping up against each other instead of one giant power structure. Exactly. And this is where the article's like, England. That was weird. England, with the king calling all the shots, that was the exception, not the rule. Most of Europe getting that much power all at once. Nearly mm -hmm. impossible. It's like the church and all these other systems, they were preventing that from happening. Wait, hold up. So are you saying, like, if I lived in, I don't know, 13th century France, my life might have actually been more free in some ways than after yeah. the Reformation. Yeah. When you've got those big, powerful states everyone's always talking about. That's what's so mind-blowing about this article. They weren't just economic groups, these private law systems. They actually, like, governed people. And the church was backing them up. They had their own rules, yeah. courts, the whole shebang. No way. Yeah. Give me an example. How did that actually work, one of these private systems? Okay, so say you're a merchant, right? Back then, in a city, you think the king's the only one telling you what to do? Nah. Your guild, they're the ones saying what you can sell, what quality, even the price. Built-in checks and balances, but like hyper-local. And the church is there, like the referee, making sure no one's going power crazy. Exactly. By supporting all these different little jurisdictions, the church is actually the one stopping any ruler who got any ideas about being all-powerful. That, according to this article, is what stopped the state from becoming what it is today. It's like the church was accidentally the best defense against big government. Wild. Right. But we don't want to call the church, like, libertarian heroes or anything. It's more about, you know, their role was way more complex than we think. And then there's this point about how kings were viewed. It's not just about ruling, it's governing, and yeah. that's different. Hold on. Break that down for me. Ruling versus governing. What's the difference in practice oh. for, like, 
a regular person? Good question. It's something most people don't even think about, but it matters. Like, is it the difference between the landlord who just wants the rent check versus the one who tells you what color to paint your kitchen? Yeah. That level of control? Exactly. You're getting it. And that's where this ties into modern libertarianism. If the church was stopping that governing power back then, maybe there's something to learn for libertarians today. Now that is a big question. But before we get into how this connects to us now, I'm curious, from all of this, what stood out to you the most? Like the most surprising thing you weren't expecting? Okay, so we've got this picture of the medieval church. Right. Well, not exactly a free-for-all, but actually like keeping a lid on centralized power. That wasn't on my bingo card for this deep dive. But how does that connect to what we think of as libertarianism like now? That's where it gets really interesting, right? The, the article talks about this whole Lutheran individualism thing. And now before you think we're getting all theological here, stick with me. All right, you've got my attention. Lutheran individualism yeah. laid on me. Okay, so Luther, right. Big on individual conscience, your own thing with God. Sounds pretty individualistic, yeah. <laughs> but the article says that focus, even though it's about religion on the surface, it actually might have made the state stronger in the long run. Unintended consequence, you know? Wait, what? How does that even work? You're saying emphasizing the individual ends up making the state more powerful. Because it's a shift, see? The medieval view, it was all about being part of a community, shared values, duties, all that. But when you put the individual first, like okay. Luther did, well, who gets to decide what those individual rights are? Who protects them? Oh, I see where you're going with this. <laughs> the state steps in to be the big protector of individual freedom. Bingo. The article's point is, even if modern libertarians want a smaller state, they're still playing by those rules, individual rights that the state guarantees. It's like trying to play a new game with the old rule book. So the medieval way was more like trying to get rid of the rule book entirely, stop the whole state as the ultimate authority thing from ever really happening. Now you're getting it. It's a totally different way of looking at things. It's not about what the state lets you do. It's about a system where there's so much going on, power so spread out that the state never gets that big in the first place. There's this line in the article really sums it up. The medieval idea of freedom was derived from the conviction that, at least in principle, every act may be publicly questioned as to its justifiability. Whoa. So it's not, I do what I want. It's more like, I got to be able to explain my actions to anyone and have a good reason. Yeah. That is different. Right. Makes you think about how differently they understood power back then. No kidding. Yeah. But we got to be real here for a sec. The church wasn't exactly known for being like super pro-individual liberty all the time. Totally fair point. The article doesn't shy away from that. Inquisitions, Galileo, they happened. We know the church has its own baggage. Exactly. So how do we square that circle? Church as a check on power, but also doing some pretty authoritarian stuff. It's about the bigger picture, I think. Not that the church was perfect, but it was part of this balancing act, you know, with rulers. The point is no one group, king or church, could just grab all the power and do whatever. So it's less about good guys and bad guys, more like yeah. understanding how power worked in a completely different world. Exactly. History is messy. Ain't that the truth? And the thing is, once that medieval system broke down, even with its problems, that's when we got the all-powerful state we know and yeah. sometimes love, I guess. Something for libertarians to think about. For real. Makes you wonder, what would a truly decentralized system look like now? How do you stop anyone, governments, corporations, from getting too big for their britches? Big questions. And I think that's where we leave it for today. If you've enjoyed this little journey into the weird world of church and state power, remember, there's always more to uncover. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, everyone. Ever get that feeling? <laughs>